Well, I think we should start and hello and welcome to our amazing panel and also for the participants who've joined this meeting today. Um, so my name's Sarah Fiddler and I'm here today to moderate this debate in my role as the co-chair of the Imperial College Global Development Hub, which I lead with Professor Mike Templeton. And my other day job is I'm a clinical professor in HIV medicine and I'm part of the Department of Infectious Diseases. So the Global Development Hub was launched here in Imperial in 2021 by Amina Mohammed, who is Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations and Chair of the United Nations Sustainable Development Group. It's an ambitious initiative and we focus on leveraging research and educational expertise in science, technology, medicine and business to impact on sustainable development challenges that are faced by the most vulnerable and marginalised people and societies where multiple global challenges are acutely concentrated. The hub at the moment is a London based platform, but our nature and work are very much focused to co-leading and co-creating interventions with our global network of alumni, academic and non-academic partners and collaborators across the 192 countries worldwide. And the Global Development Hub draws together everything that Imperial is going to address the sustainable development goals. And as an organisation with consultative status with ECOSOC and its subsidiary bodies, the Human Rights Council and other specific conditions, some meetings of the General Assembly and other intergovernmental bodies, as well as the United Nations Secretariat, we recognise the importance of bringing together partners from different disciplines to work together with end users, but also with policy makers. So I will invite you here to join us to take a closer look at an overview of how some of the economic and social challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic can be tackled by research and innovation and have the opportunity to learn more from two case studies, an account of the use of data modelling and interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary medical research to tackle the pandemic and the development of a low cost, rapid and accurate surface hygiene ver verification technology. We have three excellent speakers, all of whom are leaders in the field and will present to us initially a summary of the work they've been doing. We will then have some time at the end for discussion and questions. So just to summarise, the title of this meeting is um, the how collaborative innovation can upscale partnerships for an inclusive global recovery of COVID-19 and drive action on sustainable development goals. And as I'm sure you're aware, we're slightly ahead of the partnership that is ongoing today in the um, at the UN in, in New York. So today, the 2023 Partnership Forum of the Economic and Social Council, so ECOSOC, is being held um, in New York, um, 9 a.m. New York time. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Professor Marissa Moraldo. So Marissa is an academic director of the MSc in International Health Management, and she's part of, the, of several strategic groups at the college, including the Nutrition and Food Network Strategy Group. Marissa's expertise is on the economics and policy of healthcare innovation, the impact of policies on organisational performance and the behavioural determinants of decision making, including health risky behaviour. So just for, for format, Marissa will present for 10 minutes and then we'll pause and I'll introduce our, our subsequent two speakers and then we will have time at the end for questions. So please hold your questions or put them in the chat in the Q&A session um, box at the side of your screen. Thank you, Marissa. So thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. So in, in the 10 minutes that I've been allocated today, and it's a great pleasure to be here today, I'd like to tell you about um, you know, some ideas on how we can have better collaborative research that can then inform uh, better policies um, to address challenges related to pandemic, but a bit more generally with regards to health. So, okay. Not moving my slides. a bit of an issue. OK, so um, the biggest so the pandemic, um, the COVID-19 pandemic has been a potential one of the biggest shocks that uh, each of us has experienced in our lifetime. It had a, a substantial health impact with more than 752 million confirmed cases globally and more than 6.8 million deaths. 
but it also had a broader impact in our lives. It changed every single dimension of our behaviors and how we interact with each other. It had an impact on our consumption, on the labor market, our labor market decisions, and that associ and, and associated to the mitigating strategies um, that have been deployed in the pandemic has led to has had a huge economic impact. So it, it has been um, identified the shock, the shock as the biggest economic recession since the end of the uh, the World War II, with the economy global economy contracting around 6.6 percent uh, in 2020 only. Now it has impacted us all, but it has it hasn't affected us equally. Okay, so surely the pandemic um, occurred in um, against the backdrop of uh, increased prevalence of non-communicable disease. So those of us that had um, other diseases were affected uh, more severely. So this is the first graph that you see here on the left. But uh, health status is not the only fact that differentiates the impact of the pandemic. There's a broader set of social, economic and demographic characteristics that determine uh, which of us was more affected. So here on the right, you see that the prevalence of prolonged COVID symptoms has been more severe in the more depriving population. And the two bottoms on, on uh, the two graphs on the bottom um, uh, highlight that, for example, mortality, uh, COVID-19 mortality has been uh, more severe uh, in the most deprived uh, areas uh, of society, but also has affected different so um, ethnic ethnical groups differently. Now the pandemic, uh, so these differential impacts across the different soci uh, the different groups of society um, have not only been restricted to um, outcomes related to COVID. It also has uh, the pandemic has also affected how our behaviors differently. So in this graph, you have OECD data on health risky behaviors that are risk factors for non-communicable disease, things like uh, weight gain, exercise, alcohol and smoking. And you can see that there's a differential impact by gender, age, educational level and household income. These being risk factors of non-communicable diseases, the, this differential impact means that in the near future, we can expect these changes in behavior to translate in further health inequalities. Last but not least, we have also been impacted in other dimensions of our lives in a different way. So here you have data from the US on housing insecurity, food insecurity, financial insecurity and unemployment. And what this graph illustrates is that the, the insecurity levels caused by the pandemic have differed and have strongly more affected women, um, those from um, um, black um, uh, uh, ethnicities, those with lower level of education and uh, those that were unemployed prior to the pandemic. Now, why is this happening? Well, this is happening because um, exposure Transmission, vulnerability, and accessibility uh, vary across the different subgroups, the different different type of people in society, and these differences are strengthened, if you want, by weak policies. And weak policies meaning policies that have a differential effectiveness uh, across the different subgroups of the population, but also policies that have differential negative spillover effects across the different subgroups of the population. So in this graph here on the right, we see some of our research that looked at the impact of um, non-pharmaceutical interventions on, on mobility. And what you have here depicted is the percentage of devices staying at home. And while this has been an important and effective um, intervention, you can see clearly from this graph that those from non-white backgrounds or the poor have been less um, able to comply to such policies, potentially because their jobs um, don't enable them to work remotely. So why are these policies poorly designed? Well, first, because they tend to disregard that health and there's a, a range of factors that determines health. So our health is impacted by our lifestyle, but also our social and community networks, but also our living and working conditions. For example, our housing conditions, whether we're employed or not, our workplace environments, the built environment, educational levels. And these means that what policies that target just health vulnerability might be not optimal. They should also texture, uh, um, uh, tackle behavioral vulnerability and socioeconomic vulnerability. Secondly, because these, these uh, complexity of factors that impact your health impact us all of us differently to a different extent. 
and, uh, and, and these factors vary over time and space. So the heterogeneity of our exposure to these factors also shapes the effectiveness of interventions across the subgroups of the population. So policies to be better policies opt to the, uh, develop um, uh, poly um, uh, po interventions that take into consideration this heterogeneity and therefore are personalized, but also that adapt to the, our uh, how the, the our this different contexts and circumstances of our life evolve over time. And last but not least, health has an impact on um, almost every single behavior in your life and certainly on economic behaviors. And economic behaviors shape the economy that then have spillover effects on all those factors that affect health. So silent approaches to promote health or economic prosperity might not be optimal actually with an, uh, health inequality. So we really need policies that um, involve the whole of society and as well as all of government approaches. So policies can be improved, but also our research. From a research perspective, human behaviors are really complex to model and to change for all the reasons that I've just mentioned. So there's a dynamic and intertwined nature of health and economic behaviors. There's all this complexity of the contextual influences that vary across individuals, but also a space and time. In the context of the pandemic, there's also uh, externalities um, uh, uh, on individual behavior. So how behaviors affect others. There's also the action of pervasive feedback and spillover mechanisms associated with policies. And last but not least, all these challenges during the pandemic have been um, aggravated by high levels of uncertainty. Now, these challenges and this complexity is often disregarded in modeling and research because we tend to, to follow uh, siloed approaches. So what we need uh, is better and collaborative research. Better so then we can inform the design of smarter policies and interventions. Better research requires better data, smarter data. We need triangulated data that captures this complexity of the social, economic and health um, and health outcomes as well as their drivers. These data ought to be high frequency and as real time as possible. This data is essential to develop better modeling. Better modeling needs to be integrated, so integrate insights and modeling approaches across disciplines, not only to better characterize the complexity of vulnerability, uh, for example, to, um, to combine health and deprivations in a unique metric of, of vulnerability, but also to the develop of better interventions that capture that interconnectedness between the health and the economy. So these smart interventions need to be smart to the extent that they target well-being a bit more holistically and personalized so they capture this differential impact uh, of the different factors that impact our decisions. And they need to be adaptive, uh, meaning that they need to change to the circumstances in our environments. To be adaptive, these models need to be set in a way that they can feed routinely on uh, data from the field. So once the, these interventions are deployed, that um, these models feed from their effectiveness on the field and the factors that determine their effectiveness. So they can uh, uh, easily adapt and perfect and re-optimize those interventions. Now, if we do this to scale, um, we can even dream of, um, of um, uh, having digital twins, digital representations of individuals and communities, so that we can test these interventions uh, in silico before we deploy them in the field. Now, for this to be achievable, we really need to have better collaboration across disciplines, epidemiology, economics, behavioral science, engineering, computer science. We need the technology and the research infrastructure, and that doesn't mean that we need to set up everything from zero, uh, but you know there there's a lot of of infrastructure already existing across the different in the universities, but also outside of academia, that would just require a bit more collaboration across the different sectors. For example, a very important example is uh, there's a lot of data that is already routinely collected uh, passively that can be used to to feed in this modeling. We need, of course, funding, better funding for interdisciplinary research and incentives. And above all, we need uh, the commitment of society, of governments to follow these all of society and all of government approaches. And thank you. That's that's all I had. I think that's an enormous amount. Thank you so much, Marissa. So we will um, move on now to our next speaker. And please hold your questions for Marissa or put them in the um, Q&A or chat um, and we will get to those uh, shortly. So I'm delighted to um, present to you next my uh, colleague, um, 
Professor Katerina Hawke, who is Professor in Health Economics and the Deputy Director of the Jamil Institute at Imperial College. Katerina specialises in the economics of infectious diseases and the economic evaluation of complex public health interventions. Her research focuses on the economics of pandemic preparedness, the economics of malaria elimination, cost effectiveness analysis and health system strengthening. And I'm delighted uh, that you've been able to make time to speak with us today, Katrina. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so when I um, thought about what is the right image to start uh, my presentation on interdisciplinary research, um, I went to the Greek mythology um, and actually the case of Icarus and Daedalus, of course, which um, ended in tragedy because Icarus um, didn't heed the advice of his father Daedalus um, to steer a middle course, um, not too close to the sun, not too close to the sea, um, in order to fly out of um, out of the uh, uh, prison that they were held in. And that is for me the perfect allegory for interdisciplinary research because it tries to uh, steer a middle course between the many different objectives that policymakers have when they implement policy uh, and try to um, try to find the optimal course between those. And of course, this is the guiding principle of our interdisciplinary research that we do at the Jamil Institute for Disease and Emergency Analytics that is overarching the School of Public Health. Um, work um, that um, tries to unite um, colleagues from um, various disciplines and across various disease areas using different modeling techniques to tackle the uh, to combat disease threats um, with across our three research themes, which are outbreak response, strengthening health systems and building capacity and um, partnerships, um, which um, we uh, which we do. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but just want to present to you um, a specific uh, research that we are doing um, at the Institute. Um, which is an integrated epidemiological economic modeling that we have developed during the um, COVID-19 pandemic and now um, progressing to apply to questions of pandemic preparedness. Um, this is um, uh, the Daedalus model, um, harking back to Greek mythology here. Now, what we are doing with this integrated epi econ modeling is we are um, taking the um, sometimes incredibly sophisticated epidemiological models of the Jamil Institute, um, simplify them so that it is possible to integrate them with economic modeling um, that tries to estimate and forecasts the impact of different policy actions that happen in the health field, but that have implications for um, for the economic side of society. We use insights also of behavioral science that Marisa just talked about before to understand how individuals' behavior impacts um, on, on these outcomes all throughout. What are our outcomes? We do uh, in-depth case studies working with uh, the World Health Organization in countries around the world on specific questions that are of concern to our policy pa partners. Uh, we do capacity building and science translation across various platforms and modeling tools. And then we also have online dashboards and software tools that are um, modeling scenarios on a higher level of granularity for many countries in the world. And we are continuously updating and, uh, and developing new ones of those. I now want to give you three examples of how we have used and are currently using integrated economic epidemiological modeling. The first one is an example uh, of a low and middle income country in Southeast Asia uh, that I cannot mention, but they approached us via WHO because they wanted to know whether they should uh, extend um, the lockdown by uh, one, two or three more weeks or whether they should reopen the economy at a specific point where they were. Um, so we used the modeling in order to uh, play through different scenarios with respect to lockdown. The first scenario was that we would extend the present lockdown that the country was in. So school and business closures um, of non-essential um, activity, essentially. And we could project uh, with this integrated model both the deaths um, and also the loss uh, due to GDP that was arising because of the lockdown economy 
GDP, the deaths are, were in this scenario at a relatively low level of 1,500. The GDP loss um, over 6 billion over the projection horizon. We then compared this with a scenario of um, opening the economy, um, which would have resulted in many more deaths, 52,000. Um, and but a much lower GDP loss because the economy wasn't closed down. Um, we presented this um, to the policymaker who um, then decided that it was worth it to extend the lockdown. It was worth the economic costs um, based on our modeling. We also used uh, our integrated model to inform Indonesia on the value of their first booster vaccination campaign that they wanted to implement or did implement after their initial Sinovac double dose campaign that they had. And because Indonesia was very specific in their mitigation policy that, that went via school closure. So the country at the time that we started to uh, talk with them um, had uh, schools closed for 18 months um, at an enormous um, cost to pupils in Indonesia. And we wanted to uh, show the benefits, therefore, of the vaccination campaign, not only in the number of deaths averted, but also in the gain, in the societal gain that there would be um, if it would allow Indonesia to open schools earlier uh, than otherwise. And um, we also um, added to that the, um, the gain in terms of averted GDP loss due to business closure. And we could um, calculate that if we were going for 80% booster coverage um, over the projection horizon, that the program would save $2,000 in these um, uh, total societal costs um, per dose in the first year uh, and avert 19 million years uh, in lost in-person education um, across the country. Well, it's a very big country, Indonesia. Uh, and um, and um, these were actually constituting um, the largest uh, gain, um, bigger than the gain in terms of averted deaths. The last example is now here um, uh, going forward, what we are actually working on at the moment, which is um, using the integrated model for pandemic preparedness and calculating the benefits of being better prepared. Now, here's the uh, slightly terrifying scenario of a Spanish flu in Singapore that we just um, calculated uh, through or projected through with our model, uh, comparing two, le two uh, levels of pandemic preparedness. First, a poor level of pandemic preparedness and scenario two being a good level of pandemic preparedness. Uh, and then under the assumption that in both scenarios, Singapore would attempt to eliminate the virus um, from uh, from within their borders, um, we calculated what would be the total socioeconomic costs across lost lives that are valued in monetary terms, business closures and school closures uh, for these two scenarios. And um, please consider that the two metrics are different. So the, um, the deaths, of course, being much higher and um, the costs being higher um, in the case of poor level of pandemic preparedness. Now, the um, good news is that um, actually the um, good level of pandemic preparedness is, is what characterizes Singapore today. So, um, so we will predict um, about a loss of 21% of annual GDP should Singapore be hit by the Spanish flu and attempt elim elimination once the epidemic starts. So these are just uh, a few of the examples of the interdisciplinary research that we are doing. Uh, we think that it is imperative um, to have a pro effective program of multidisciplinary research to combat um, the future disease threats that are arising to us, to us not only from, uh, from outbreaks, um, infectious disease outbreaks, or, uh, but also from other challenges such as climate change and, uh, and the challenges related to wars and um, population displacements. So there are high rewards in interdisciplinary research, but there are also, um, we have found, uh, quite, uh, quite big challenges in uh, order uh, to set up an interdisciplinary research program. And maybe we can discuss that in our dis can, uh, panel discussion later. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Thank you, Katerina. Lo lots of food for thought here. Um, and thank you for keeping to time, everybody. 
So our final speaker, um, who we are delighted who's been able to join us, is Alex Bond, who is the co-founder and CEO of a company called FreshCheck. Alex used to go to Imperial, so he's an Imperial College alumni, and he has developed from research undertaken by himself and his co-founders, FreshCheck, which offers affordable solutions to verify hygiene in the food, hospitality and healthcare industries. And clearly we definitely needed him a few years ago, certainly. If their patented technology changes color from purple to any other color, it then warns people that the facilities are not clean enough. So he's using amazing technology to actually show the use of these products and actually how they can reassure us that they're working how we want them to. So Alex, I hope that's a reasonable introduction to, to what you're going to talk to us about. And we're very keen to hear in more detail your, your um, fascinating research. Thank you for joining us. No, thank you very much for having me along. It's a pleasure to get to speak to you all today and a, a real privilege to speak along Katerina, Marissa and yourself. And yeah, as, as you said, I'm going to try and give a slightly more microscopic view of, um, of what we did. And you've perfectly outlined what we do, colour change tests to confirm whether or not services are clean. And so, as it's called in the industry, verifying hygiene is crucial for lots of different industries. But food industry is one of the biggest ones. An outbreak of disease in the food industry can lead to food being wasted, it can lead to recalls and it can lead to brand damage. And ultimately, it can also lead to loss of life, which is something that nobody wants. And so when we looked into this a little bit more, we found that the current tools just aren't able to meet the current needs. They're expensive per swab test and they also require a 750 pound handset, which means that small companies and small organizations simply can't afford to adopt the system. The complexity is also a limiting factor in the adopting this technology, not just across small companies, but even wider ones. And so when we initially started to tackle this problem, we developed the fresh check spray, which would change color, as you said, it starts off purple, changes color to green, orange, or anything else to warn you about contamination. It was rapid, it was affordable, and the simplicity meant that we thought it was available for lots of different companies to make hygiene testing available for everyone. So to give you a bit of the backstory of it, we launched the spray in 2018, and just about a year later, we had 85K in revenue. So 2020 was gonna be a fantastic year for us. It was the best year, but of course, the reason that we're here today came and interrupted us as well, COVID-19. Now, as, as Sarah uh, alluded to, it could have potentially been a very useful time for us because the market was looking for hygiene verification, but we found that there were a couple of problems with the tool that we were offering. So what we found was that the spray itself required too much change in user behavior. People were used to using swabs, ironically, in the food industry before COVID. And so <clears throat> the risk of switching to a spray, which was an entirely new style of product, was just too great. And for the smaller companies, they were so cash strapped during this period that adopting any new hygiene verification methods just didn't have the return on investment that they were looking for. So with that in mind, we went back to the drawing board and, and tried to come up with a new solution, a swab test of our own. And it was with the Sustainable Innovation Grant that we were able to do that. So at the beginning of the pandemic, Innovate UK released the Sustainable Innovation Grant to help companies like ours or any company that would work that would help to prevent COVID having an immediate effect, but also long-term effect. And it was this funding that allowed us to develop our first prototypes of the Fresh Check Swab. So we took it out there, uh, we raised money, we'd, we'd been able to develop it. And then we were hit with another issue. Now this issue was caused by COVID and other regional events, but ultimately it meant that the global supply chain was not as reliable as it once was. For us, it, that meant delays in terms of shipping arriving, which meant it was unreliable, and it also affected the cost of goods coming in and out. And in quite a price sensitive market, that's something that really affected us. That meant that even though we had an initial swap, we had to go back to the drawing board and develop an entirely new system that was more locally manufacturable. And so to do that, we relied on a huge network of connections. We were able to secure financial support from the Innovate UK EDGE programme. We also were able to rely on Hammersmith and Fulham's uh, COVID grants, which helped us essentially keep the lights on during the, the process of development. We also were able to rely on UK manufacturing expertise through the likes of the MCC, Biocheck, Manapac and Rutland Plastic, where I actually am today. Although we're scientists by background, we also found some technical expertise which is going to be helpful. 
So fellow companies at Scale Space and Imperial College London White City Incubator were able to bounce ideas off us so that we could develop the technology. And Loughborough University was extremely helpful in determining what plastics we needed to use and what was the best plastic for our tool. And so, although we were the project lead, I think it's safe to say, without a doubt, that without this network, we wouldn't have been able to develop the breast check hygiene verification system. And so that brings us pretty much up to date, but well, we're launching the breast check hygiene verification system next month. So if any of you keeping track, that's tomorrow. So it's a busy time for us at the moment. But um, we do now have a localized supply chain, which we're really happy about. And so we've repackaged our entire system so that we now have a color change swab, the fact that it's a swab means that it aligns with what the current customers are doing. And the fact that it's color change means that you don't need a reader of any form. So it's accessible to any, any organization or any company that needs to do hygiene testing. We've also developed a free to use app so that people can record their results, it keeps a digital record, and then they can analyze that data on the browser. That allows them to identify areas of risk so that they can potentially prevent an outbreak of an infectious disease. And throughout this, our goal has been to create an accessible hygiene verification tool. And I think accessible preventive measures have benefits across lots of different industries. So when we're looking primarily at the food industry, the record of due diligence allows small companies to access larger contracts. Small companies need to have a record to say, yes, we've been doing this hygiene testing, but they haven't previously been able to afford it. So this allows them to sell into the likes of local supermarkets, reducing the supply chain and making good quality food available locally. And I've spoken a lot about the food industry, but this is also applicable across new markets. If you think about healthcare, hospital associated infections, something that can prevent the infection in the first place will of course be incredibly important. But it stretches beyond that to nursing homes, gyms, cruise ships, offices, areas of high public, high public touch points or high public footfall can potentially benefit from this. Because ultimately, this will help to avoid the outbreak of infectious disease. And I think that the world has become a lot more aware of infectious disease. The sheer financial cost, but also the cost of welfare, well-being, lives, has been so great that people now know that you don't want to have another pandemic. And so what we've seen throughout that is that although no, everyone wants to avoid it, there's been slightly less awareness about the preventive measures that can be implemented, such as ourselves, though certainly not limited to us. And we think that there's certainly an area of uh, improvement on implementing preventive measures across the board. On a slightly lighter note, COVID changed the way we work. Companies and organizations are far better equipped to take training uh, calls virtually, which means that we don't have to travel, which is good for reducing our carbon footprint, but also makes it more affordable and much easier to reach smaller companies. From the lab side of things though, the actual research we do still requires people in on site and then in the lab, but it's quite nice to have a slightly different change of pace uh, from working from home all the time. And the final thing I want to touch on is the regulatory side of things. So we obviously work under regulatory frameworks to a degree, but we've seen that from COVID, there haven't really been a huge amount of changes in terms of the regulation around hygiene awareness and hygiene testing. Oh, oh well, hygiene awareness probably is quite high, but hygiene testing certainly is not so much. Um, although our focus is to work from the bottom up and have a ripple effect where we can help improve hygiene verification in an affordable method with return on investment for our customers, we think that there is definitely scope for potential regulations to come in and help to facilitate that change so that we can live in a much more safe and a much more hygienic environment and hopefully prevent the next, uh, well hopefully there won't be a next outbreak, but hopefully prevent another outbreak. Uh, and thank you, that's all I have for today. Amazing, Alex. Thank you so much. And thank you to all three of you again. I think they're very complimentary presentations and, and very um, timely and thoughtful. Um, Thank you to our audience online. I can see um, a couple of questions which I will start with. Um, I think maybe Marissa, you might want to take this first, but really it's relevant to all of you and, and perhaps you might all in turn have a go at responding to this. But somebody has asked us, what steps are scientists taking to address the loss of trust in science and government that has been a big side effect of this latest COVID pandemic, and particularly with those groups that you showed us, Marissa, in, in the sort of uh, harder to reach with different socioeconomic groups. 
think I'm not I'm not sure I have the right answer to that, but I would say that even trust, trust is something that we can model, that we can understand the drivers of the lack of trust, um, um, how the role of misinformation, for example, and how that shapes our behaviors. Again, it's an area that is of immense importance for health, but also economic behaviors a bit more generally. And um, I think I think as scientists, we're trying to understand is the complexities of that lack of trust. Um, it's it's not, and I think it's you know lack of trust and lack of compliance with policies is often dismissed as um, you know people bad will to do things or to comply or you know we, we stigmatize a bit those populations but we need those populations that don't trust and don't comply to policies as they are expected um, or they are anticipated to there's a variety of reasons for that um, so I think as policymakers but also policymakers as well as scientists need to make a better job not only understanding the reasons and the drivers of lack of trust but then embedding those in design of better interventions and, and I think as scientists that is that is what we are widely doing. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. I mean, my my personal experience of working through COVID was that, like you very clearly showed, but the people who are actually in, in industries like what they called key workers, we did not have a choice of going. We're going to stay at home on our with our laptop and bake banana bread and get paid. And so there's a kind of sense of frustration that the policies were kind of everybody's got to stay at home. Oh, but not you. And then the ones who had had to keep going into work, who were vastly overrepresented from vulnerable, slightly different social economic groups, were the very ones that actually couldn't manage without going to work. So I, I feel like one of the messages, and I know you all know this, but there's there's modeling and then there's kind of the messages have to be honest. And I think they weren't. Exactly. Uh, yeah, the expectations also, but there also needs to be a recognition that we can't comply if you want using the word comply that I don't really don't like, but we, we won't react to the same extent because we are constrained on the things that we do. You know, you know, of course, healthcare workers were a big example, but people in more precarious jobs uh, in manufacturing, in sectors where there's no regulation, in countries where there's even less regulation, they had to face the very hard choice of uh, losing their livelihoods or putting themselves yeah. at risk during the yeah. pandemic. And that is really neglected in, in, the po in policies, in their design yeah. and how they are, yeah. they are designed, but also in the discourse, as you say, and how they are con conveyed to, to the public. And of course, that, that you know, generates a lot of uh, discontent, but also uh, social disapproval of others' behaviours, but you know, without really an understanding on the reasons why. And I think that's, yeah, that needs to change. So, so when you do your modelling, what percentage of the population do you allow to be in inverted commas non-compliant for an intervention to affect what you want? Maybe Catalina. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I would say um, as a scientist, I would say that depends, right? That depends on the research question and on the um, specific intervention we are looking at. Um, but of course, um, what we are trying to do is um, in our modeling integrate behavioral responses that are, if you so want, impacted on by the dynamics of the disease so that the behavioral response changes over the course of the pandemic. So while Marisa is more in the, in the field of trying to change behavior to a more socially optimal outcome. I guess our approach um, uh, with the Equan Epi modeling is to take that, to uh, allow for behavior change and then see how policy interventions need to be changed to cope with this changing behavior. Um, I mean, totally agree with everything that, uh, that you said, but I think I would want to add another uh, layer to this, and this is about science communication. So how can we communicate science to the general public, which I think is a very important um, objective, should be a very important objective for scientists um, in all disciplines. And I think during COVID, we have learned a lot on how to do that better. And we, for example, we have set up an online um, uh, uh, COVID um, program on the Coursera platform that people can attend. And, um, that, and the philosophy behind that was we wanted to show that science changes as circumstances changes and science is trial and error. And 
and often our projections will not uh, be what pans out in reality because there are projections. They are not forecasts. They try to give alternative policy uh, options and show show the impact of those. But it's not that we can forecast um, what will happen, of course. So I think that's something very important to communicate. And I have to say that our um, um, program on public engagement, for example, the, sci um, the science in context videos that we produce, they attract a lot of views on YouTube and on other social media channels. Uh, and we get um, all our researchers to uh, in turn um, present their research. We uh, try to um, do that in lay language terms uh, and um, have some nice graphics as well that explain the modeling that is being done. So I think that can be, I think we need more emphasis on this going forward and also experts in communicating science translation. So people in colleagues in at Imperial and other institutions who are specifically hired for that purpose to communicate science well. Absolutely. And Alex, your experiences, you were poised to, to sort of market your amazing new um, hygiene product at a time of enormous need. And, you know, in terms of, of addressing what we're talking about now, how in retrospect, how how could you have made Matt Hancock decide he was going to buy your product for everybody, not just say, oh, you've got to stop making it now because we are closing restaurants. <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, That's perhaps a million pound question quite literally for us. Um, so in retrospect, I think had we been approaching it a little bit earlier, we would have gone straight for the preventive measure. I think we didn't know what the lockdowns were going to hold for companies. Uh, and for different organisations and the sheer cost that that was going to come with. So I think knowing what we know now about how valuable it would be to stay open, to make sure that people are aware of touch points um, and cross-contamination, we would perhaps have approached it in a slightly more, I think actually scientific approach. We'd have said, look, here is, here is a return on investment in a way that we couldn't at the time quantify. Um, I still don't think that we have the answer to that though. I think finding the return on investment whether that's for places opening or not with a preventive measure is still something that's difficult. And I think, you know, we're working on that constantly, but if anyone else has the answer, I would be more than happy to open the field for them because uh, we'll, we'll learn from that. Can I ask you just a nerdy question a minute? What, what causes the colour change? Is it bacterial DNA or something? Or what, what are you detecting? Of course. Um, yes, so this is, here's my science communication in practice. So we have a dye which is attached to an iron atom. When the iron is removed, the dye changes colour. So that's it in its simplest form. But bacteria give off a small molecule called a siderophore, and it's that molecule which takes away the iron and causes the colour change. So when you get to a certain threshold of bacteria, that's when you, you know there's a risk, and that's when you get the colour change. And do viruses do the same? Unfortunately not, no. Okay. So this, this is where it gets a little trickier. We use bacteria as an indicator organism to say if you've cleaned the surface to such a level that you've removed bacterial contamination, because viruses are that much easier to remove from the surface, you yeah. should be mostly clean. However, I understand that that's not quite the indicative test people are looking for. Mind you, I think we probably all want your gadget. Every time you're going to sit at a restaurant where the table's a bit sticky, I'd like to have your... <laughs> Anyway, I'm sorry to go back to the proper conversation. So I, I think one of the important questions in the chat is about what policies would the panel put into place now to try and ensure we're prepared much better for a future pandemic? Because obviously there's an enormous um, will at the moment globally about saying we need pandemic preparedness organisations and collaborations. And I know, Katerina, you, you particularly addressed some of this in, in your presentation. I don't know if you want to start trying to think through and, and explain to us what, what's in place at the moment. Yeah, so I, I guess um, there is first the more narrow view that we have as scientists, you know, what kind of modeling structures, what kind of um, data um, agreements do we want to put in place that we can scale up the modeling very fast um, in case a new pandemic strikes. So for for us as the science sector, I think that's a very important task that we have um, uh, models that 
have different modules. So one for the economy, maybe, and another one that models vaccine um, and the um, vaccines in greater detail, or another model that um, can be geographically disaggregated and so forth. So that we have a library of models that we can just deploy straight away. Now, what does that require? That requires us to um, now in kind of, if you want peace times, invest in these modeling capacity and regularly update the model the models with latest evidence. So I think that's for our scientists. Now, in general, what kind of policies is the world thinking about? They're thinking about surveillance, you know, what kind of surveillance do we want to have put in place? Um, investments into health systems, um, investments into not only vaccine R&D, but also vaccine manufacturing capabilities in um, all regions of the world. Um, so these are, I, I, I guess, the discussions that are ongoing um, at the moment. I think what's important when thinking about pandemic preparedness is not to distract funding from other urgent um, priorities. And as economists, we know that there are some economies of scope, if you so want, in 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 many of the inter investments, particularly the one into healthcare systems, into integrated data systems, and so so they will benefit other diseases while we are kind of waiting for the next epidemic to happen. And if that can leverage to best effect, I think that would be really uh, an important step um, to Im increase improve population health. Thanks, Katrina and Marissa. Do you? What's your sense of what we've learned in terms of pandemic preparedness so that whatever we do moving forward it works much better across the entire, if that's possible, communities where, where we've learned what we missed out? Uh, I think, I mean, I think one thing we learned and we, we should have known that, in, I mean, we knew that and many of us knew that, is that you are not ready for a pandemic if you have uh, pre-existing inequalities in health and socioeconomic inequalities. And, 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 and that's not only because of the equity implications of that, but it's also because of what, what I tried to pitch, that people in certain circumstances might not behave in a way that is socially optimal. So I think just to address the question that one of the key things that you need to do urgently is start thinking of um, needs, not only in terms of health and when things occur, but a bit more well-being more generally. So ensuring that you know populations are more or less at the same level that they can cope uh, or we can cope uh, when, when the pandemic um, uh, comes. Mm. The other thing that I think we really need and really didn't work at all, not all from a scientist, but I also think at a policy level, is that we don't have the data infrastructure. I mean, we suddenly we have been able to mobilize 60 in our team only, 60 people to work um, uh, towards this modeling that Katrina was explaining and help and inform policy making your pandemic. And we spent the first months of our work trying to get data that should be there to start with, like how many ventilators exist in hospitals. Surely we should know that. Uh, things like, um, you know, we did a piece of work on modeling and prioritization into hospital care. We couldn't look at disparities um, in morbidity because we don't have um, patient level data linked with socioeconomic characteristics to the granularity that will enable us to do that. Things like, I mean, with Katarina, I think she can relate to that. You know, we sat through many different meetings trying to say, okay, if we don't have it in the public system, can we get this data from private providers, for example, credit card providers, because we thought that's a great way to get consumption data so we can look at these spillover effects. That data, so we don't have these integrated systems of data collection, and that's essential, essential, if we want really to respond quickly when these shocks come. And it's true for pandemics, but it's true for any shock, as Katarina was alluding to. So I think as a priority, you really need to start, you know, and again, it's not setting up an infrastructure from zero, but it's trying to look at what we have mm -hmm. and better ways to, for this data to communicate. Absolutely. And Alex, for you, if a new virus comes along that we've never heard of before, do you think that there is structures in place for your team as a representation of sort of, you know, highly innovative, you've got new technology to go, OK, give me the sequence of this virus and I'll try and work out how I can adapt what is an amazing tool for a new organism that you don't know anything about at the moment? Is, is that interaction in place? I, not for our company specifically, but I certainly think that there is a gap between high level like this is what needs to happen and small companies that are perhaps able to move quite quickly to tackle these problems. When it's a small team, you can be much more mobile and say, okay, we've got a new uh, 
DNA sequence and we can develop something specifically for that. And I think small companies are used to jumping between targets to make sure they're, they're onto the right, um, they're looking at the right topic. So I think there is there is something to say for that. However, I, I don't think it's as, it's as easy as saying companies can do this or my company could do this. I think it's something that would have to go out quite broadly. These challenges are easy. But if the There's infrastructure was in place, which is what I'm trying to say, which I think is what Marissa and Katrina have kind of shared with us, is that if there was a new pandemic, there should be a database of here's all the technology companies that are doing all sorts of things that could be relevant. If we shared right from what was it, December 2019, when they had the viral sequence of this current, you know, SARS-CoV-2, with all these different technology companies, does somebody know who these are all are, and could you you do you see what I mean? It, it's, I think that's yeah. what you're saying, Maurice, isn't it? If we set up structures now to go, somebody and suppress an email to all those companies, for example, to say, here's where we're working and here's a new pandemic we're working on. Absolutely. I mean, there's such, there's such a wealth of different ideas and different things going on there. If it is able to reach people, then ways that people haven't necessarily thought of combating it, whether it's an mRNA sequence yeah, exactly, or something exactly. or the other, I think absolutely, because then you're tapping into areas of industry that you perhaps didn't know had expertise in this, yeah. and that can potentially yeah. collaborate. So absolutely, if it's available, that would definitely be beneficial. Um, we've got one more question in, in the chat, which I'd just like to go to now. I think it's really on the theme we've talked about a bit before, about the inequalities and the vaccine, sort of basically how impressively we did do in the COVID pandemic. So. The estimates are that um, the COVID vaccine cuts the death rate of COVID by more than half overall. And in terms of science communication, has really enough been done to actually communicate this extraordinary feat of technology that, you know, from having a, a virus we'd never even heard of to actually cutting the death rate and actually making a, a preventative, a pretty decent preventative vaccine in you know basically about 12 months it's extraordinary and, and and i understand there's multiple layers of why people were, were hesitant or still are hesitant but how could we do better on that and, and how would this be relevant for the future so rather than sort of focus too much on covid now but but how can we think about this with respect to other infectious diseases that are really challenging the sdg goals globally i don't know who wants to take that marissa you look you look like you're ready to respond. So, so again, vaccination decisions are complex. In our research, we identified that around, is it 101 factors that determine our decisions? Surely the way that we convey the benefits of the vaccination, but also how we design the policies is immensely important. So a bit, a bit of research that we did uh, was to try to evaluate the impact of the um, vaccination, em employer-based vaccination mandates in the US where we had hypothesized that the way it was framed, was framed in a way, was it communicated, that was taking, people would perceive the, the, the mandate as taking control of something that is our own right of choosing. And where they hypothesized that actually would fire back and have a, a, decline, in, a decline in vaccination rates. And it, it, it exactly happened that. So psychological reactance is a very well-documented phenomenon when with regards to decision-making. And there are ways of framing the policies, not only on the how we designed. So in the US was important that there was an alternative testing, um, uh, but the threat of losing your job and you, you know, and how it was communicated that you must do that. People did really perceive it. Those that were left out to vaccinate, of course, did really perceive that that you know you're messing up with my own autonomy in taking my decisions. That can be improved with science communication, but also with a better design of these policies. So again, it goes back to understand why people do things. Why do they behave in certain ways? And what do you think the impact has been on acceptance of other vaccines because of the fallout of, of people not wanting to have COVID? I mean, is there any data globally on how many people accept, you know, smallpox, polio, or all the other vaccines that we should be offering to all our children? I, I can't answer that. I don't know. I haven't come across that evidence. Um, you know, there's, in a sense, for those that have decided to vaccinate, you know, I would expect them to be more open to other types of vaccination. But from those on the reactant side, those that decide or not, that might actually be quite detrimental for other types of vaccination. But this is just a research hypothesis. Uh, what, what I would, would think that, uh, the effects are there. Again, they are complex um, uh, to understand. But again, this is the type of things we should be 
really investing on? Because, you know, if you think of other contexts of health, it's bad that people don't comply to policies um, in the context of non-communicable diseases. But in the context of infectious disease, it's even worse because the externalities that people behaviors in the context, for example, of vaccination generate on others. You know, if you just have a small group of dissident people, that's just, even if it's small, that's just enough to cause havoc at societal level and lead to huge loss of health and, you know, lives and, and economic productivity. So we really need, you know, when you look at all these modelings, you know, we, we tend to break people in, into buckets, right? By age, by health vulnerability, they have comorbidities, by sex. But within each of those boxes, boxes there's a variety of, of people uh, that are quite unique on the reasons on why they vaccinate or not, why they self-isolate or not, that if we don't have a better understanding of that, then we'll never have policies that you know, they might work on average, but they don't work for all for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think that on that note, I'm I'm absolutely delighted that we've had the opportunity to have this conversation. It's a fantastic piece of work you're all doing, and I really hope that anyone who can can join. I think you're allowed to join the the UN, and I'm sure they will publish the discussion that's going on about to open shortly in New York. Um, and we feel very lucky and privileged to have your time to share your research with us. So thank you all very much. And um, thanks to the Global Development Hub for organising uh, this meeting. <laughs>